Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, very much appreciate your time. My name is Charles Clark. I am a physicist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is an agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and I'm a member of the Joint Quantum Institute, which is a joint institute between the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the University of Maryland. Uh, last December, I started teaching a new course, a three-week long course, taught it in the, in the winter term and the summer term at the University of Maryland in January and in June of 2020, respectively. Uh, it's called Quantum Boot Camp, and it's the first course in our um, new quantum information specialization. And it's a course intended for majors in uh, or undergraduate majors or early year graduate students in computer science and engineering and chemistry and mathematics, uh, people without uh, substantial backgrounds in physics. So sort of like physics for quantum applications. And let's say, you know, success is mixed because, uh, well, there's a lot about quantum physics, and so one has to be uh, selective, but not too superficial. So in the um, most recent outing of the course, I focused on teaching one application, and that seemed to work pretty well. I mean, the students managed to, uh, well, what I told them at first was, my goal is to help you pass a technical interview at a quantum computing company. So like, if they ask you to explain how does a quantum computer work, uh, you can at least say, well, I can't really do that much, but perhaps I could tell you how an important quantum information protocol works, because I, I can understand that, and I think I can explain it to you. And I think that's possible for you to approach that level of proficiency with the materials in these three lectures, but we'll just see. In any event, my, my goal is to give you an understanding of an important quantum information protocol at a level whereby you can do sort of a security analysis of it and explain how it might be modified or used in other contexts. That protocol is quantum cryptography. That's the, here's the, here's the um, quantum cryptography is the phrase that's used on this article that appeared in Nature uh, just two months ago, uh, June 2020. It's one of the most spectacular achievements in quantum cryptography. Hey, Charles. It, Yes, sir. Uh, we're just seeing your your um, your cover sheet there. Oh, I, I'm. Do you see the arrow moving on it? Oh, okay, that article. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still on the I'm still on the first page. So yes, okay. in the in the upper left hand corner, the upper left hand frame, you'll see this diagram. It shows a, a, a it's, it's a diagram. An experiment was done in China where an orbiting satellite sent single photon quantum cryptographic signals to two telescope based ground stations. This is a technical uh, tour de force. The article tells you what it's about. But it's an achievement in the first, really the first practical um, application of quantum information, so-called quantum cryptography. This was I. Uh, process identified by uh, Gilles Brassard and Charles Bennett, published in 1984 as a theoretical proposal. And within about uh, five or six years, it was actually implemented them, by them uh, in a laboratory setting at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Laboratories in New York. And I would say, in my opinion, the, the key ideas of this cryptography protocol, so-called BB84 for Bennett Brassard, Bravo Bravo 84, Bennett Brassard 84. Uh, it's the framework that it uses and the concepts upon which it calls are, are core to many 
important applications of quantum information. So I'm going to try to bring you up to speed to actually be able to think seriously and maybe even innovate a little bit on top of that in these three lectures uh, without using uh, more than the minimal mathematics that's needed. This is not a substitute for quantum physics course, but maybe uh, you know, you'll get to a level of understanding where at least you'll be able to use the things that I've used in this course as a mnemonic for the light. Like you, maybe you can't actually think about how to derive something, but you can imagine by an analogy with quantum cryptography how it might be done. So uh, today's lecture is going to be just on uh, cryptography or encryption and decryption to give sort of a background to why this issue is important and then to illustrate by historical examples of how it has led to the concepts that are used in quantum cryptography. Uh, and the, the second lecture will, the, an important part of quantum cryptography uh, in, in every context is the um, the randomness of quantum mechanics. And so um, the second lecture will be associated with explorations of quantum randomness in the context of, de of production and detection of light. And then the, the final lecture will actually go in depth into the um, BBA84 protocol, which will use uh, examples from these lectures. Okay, so now the, if I can, the first slide. slide. Information wants to be free. Who, who here is familiar with this meme? There's actually a Wikipedia article, a Wikipedia page with the title, Information Wants to be Free, which you know discusses this so-called cyberpunk ethic that was uh, prominent at the beginning of the internet. So, let me interrupt one more time. We've got, uh, so on your screen, it looks like you have the Zoom window over on the top right, a square there. Oh, I, I should get rid of that, shouldn't Minim I? Minimize Hang. that bad boy. Yeah. Okay. How do I and at the top, it looks like your Zoom menu is down. Oh, yeah. So how do I get rid of that? You should be able to just move your cursor up there, just click something, and it should make it disappear. Click something on your on your uh, screen, your other screen, your hit the Pennsylvania image or something. More. We got the hide video panel. Yeah, you still have your menu. So if you if you click, not there. Click click your PowerPoint. Okay. And the Zoom menu is not disappearing. Uh, I don't. I don't see it disappear. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just have to deal with it. Okay. So just be aware of that very top one inch. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll just. Um, maybe I'll. 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 I'll do it this way for the moment. I can't really figure out how to. Uh, okay. We'll work on that for tomorrow then. Okay, yeah. If you, okay, so maybe maybe this, if I enlarge this, it'll be good enough. Okay, so the you know the early days of the internet, it seemed like the you know a great thing was happening. Uh, you can imagine free access to all knowledge. In some sense, you know that's that's still a dream uh, that's being pursued. But if we look at how the internet is today, it it has five billion users. I mean, I looked this up on the internet, but this is this is basically five billion is the number of uh, internet-enabled smartphones that are in use now. It's a good fraction of the world's population, and why? It offers you uh, you know access to an immense quantity of goods and services. So for example, 
games, video, music, text, uh, their copyrights and let's say um, encryption and decryption procedures associated with the transmission of this information. Uh, also uh, valuable services, business to business, business to consumer. I mean, I assume that many of you, you know, make purchases and um, maintain financial accounts, trade stocks and so on on the internet. Um, medical records are transmitted. Uh, there's, we have correspondence with friends and business uh, associates. Uh, social media and the you know, certain like community organizations uh, depend critically on the internet. Crime, a big industry. I'm not advocating the practice of crime, <laughs> but the suppression of crime is you know certainly something that we can all sort of agree with. Um, has its own secure. Both those have their own security requirements. Uh, vice, let's say, by that I mean uh, activities which are not illegal but might mm, violate one's employer's um, regulations for use of business equipment. Uh, espionage and warfare. Well, there you know, there's only a small community engaged in that, but once again, it's something where. Uh, the security and secrecy, secrecy of, um, of uh, information is very important. Now, on the other side, there's the, the cyberpunk anthem. Information wants to be free, and I want to honor this, um, probably the best known martyr in that cause, Aaron Swartz, whose, um, uh, whose main cause was the um, making the results of scientific research freely available to all without paywalls and so on. And um, that is something where I will say, you know, his, it has, yes, not succeeded to the extent that he hoped, but he certainly caused things to move in that direction. Well, now what about, uh, what about these the legal underpinning of these of these issues, copyright and patents in particular? You know, fortunately, we live in the United States of America. I love this Pennsylvania road sign, which I've seen many times across the border of Pennsylvania. Birthplace of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. So the Constitution of the United States, actually, in Article One, its first article, contains a statement about copyright and patents. So here quoting, the Congress shall, my italics, shall have the power to fix the standards of weights and measures. I, I threw that in because it's in section A as well, and it's a function of my employer, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, branch of the US Department of Commerce. Secondly, here's another one, another part of Article 8, Section 8. <clears throat> to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and vendors the exclusive right to their respective rights and discoveries. So that gives the a justification for patent and copyright law. But note that the Constitution doesn't mandate the existence of those things. It only authorizes Congress to, and Congress only, to define them within the United States of America. And uh, uh, Congress acted early on that and has consistently pursued it. And again, I think, you know, I can, I could construct an argument against both patent and copyright, and many societies live without, without those um, uh, provisions in their laws. Uh, but I can equally uh, construct an argument for, and it's basically um, based on the idea that if you allow property rights in the development of intellectual property in a limited sense, that will tend to cause more of it to exist than less. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, cryptography. I wonder if I can go to the full screen here. I can 
humanity. So, uh, cryptography. Here I give the, um, the definition of cryptography that's uh, made in the Oxford English Dictionary. And the, the virtue of the Oxford English Dictionary, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is that it records the usage of the word that's being defined from its earlier times, earliest time in the English language, and then and then follows it uh, follows it along with subsequent uses. So the first the first uh, use of cryptography. Let's say, oh yes, what's the root? Cryptos means hidden, like crypt, as in where a body is buried. That's a that's an instance of crypt or cryptic meaning obscure or mysterious. Uh, cryptos for hidden and graphia for writing. And this word is first used, a remarkable book written by John Wilkins in the year 1641 with this extraordinary title, Mercury or the Secret and Swift Messenger, showing how a man may with privacy and speed communicate his thoughts to a friend at any distance. Well, you might be thinking, well, duh, you know, there's Twitter. But in 1641, there wasn't electricity. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't any, there wasn't any use of electricity as a functional product. And in fact, even in, in, in countries like England, the roads weren't so good. So there's, a, it seems, you know, how could you possibly have this idea of communicating any distance? And I'm going to start with that uh, because it, it brings out some concepts developed long ago that actually pretty much define the framework of modern communication when they put, put into the practice with modern technology and then we'll, um, we'll go to uh, the aspect of secrecy. So maybe this would be a time for me to call for comment. Uh, who has an idea of how one might devise in the conditions of you know, mid 17th century England, a mechanism for communicating messages uh, for any, along any distance? Well, the Chinese used smoke signals across, uh, alongst the, uh, the, the um, Great Wall. Excellent answer. In fact, uh, that brings me to the next slide. Oops. That was not a plant. <laughs> Let me it was like a network of sorts. Yes, indeed. So uh, there is a um, there's an instance well recorded that happened about 60 years before uh, Wilkins' book, the sighting of the Spanish Armada off the coast of Cornwall in England, and uh, so going from the upper right corner here's Queen Elizabeth, shown in a contemporary portrait. In the middle, the lays of ancient Rome this is a, an illust engraved illustration from a book that includes a poem, The Armada by Macaulay, which I recommend for its you know, lively nature. And it shows that there was a national warning system in England in those days consisting of beacons. These are fires. Here's in the, the lower left, you see two of these, these beacon holders in which um, uh, wood would be lit, that, and the, the, in the upper left, you can see this engraving of uh, the fires being uh, lit. In the lower right, you can see a map, roughly contemporaneous, that shows the placement of beacons in the county of Kent, quite a number of these stations between Dover and London. So according to the poem of Macaulay, which may have some historical accuracy, it was within a matter of hours of the sighting 
of this um, of this great fleet off the coast of Cornwall that the entire kingdom of England was aware of uh, well what did they know they knew there was an emergency of grave importance basically an invasion England had often been invaded uh, and so this was a signal that could be communicated fairly rapidly I mean it would propagate more or less at the speed of light between the different nodes of the beacons and then it would take some human effort to light the, the, the beacon in the next place, but it's very effective. Uh, then the uh, remaining uh, reminiscences of this system are present in place names like Beacon Hill, well-known uh, neighborhood in Boston, Massachusetts. Here's the Massachusetts uh, State House, was used as a beacon site because it, it has an overview both of the um, of the inner harbor of Boston and the ocean approaches to it. Uh, there's a Beacon Hill in Seattle with the same uh, name and some other places as well. So this uh, a more convenient form of this system. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the full screen now because there's not so much head header material. Oops. All right. Uh, well, here is the, the essentials of this, the, the banner doesn't obscure. In his book, Wilkins shows a system that's involves a form of digitization of information that was first proposed by uh, Polybius, a philosopher from the uh, Roman Empire days. And uh, it, it can be implemented by, um, a ser uh, a, by 10 torches. In fact, I've got an illustration here of a tiki torch, which is on sale at Walmart these days. In fact, Walmart sells these in packages of 10, uh, which you may think maybe the Polybius concept is, is, having a, uh, is having a renaissance. Anyway, you know what a tiki torch is. It's on a stake, and you can stake it in your yard. And the basic idea of Polybius is that you have, well, first of all, note this table here, <coughs> which has... 25 letter values encoded in a five by five alphabet. So these 25 letters are the letters of the English language as it was used in, uh, in England in, in uh, Wilkins' time. And so uh, how do you send messages? Well, you set up these two rows of five lamps each and then um, an operator uh, holds up a certain number of torches in the right hand. Uh, so, um, and in the left hand, according to the numerical values given on the table. So H would be um, uh, three torches in the, the right hand, which is, of course, the right hand of the person that's facing you and two torches in the left hand. So it uses this digital digitization of the alphabet to create a means of sending an arbitrary alphabetic, uh, arbitrary sequence of uh, alphabet symbols. And in fact, it's a rather ingenious idea because you can imagine the actual, the actual alignment of the torches in each row isn't so sensitive and it's and not not so important to hold the the two displaced torches is exactly the same level above in other words 
you have this background frame that makes it possible for a person at a good distance away from you to see that optical signal. So this is a, you know, the, an anticipation of optical telegraphy. Is it clear from what I've said how this, uh, these signals are being made? Following it. Okay. Any questions or comments, anybody? Discussion is good. You can down you can download this book as I have done from Google Books. So, and I I strongly agree with reading this. It's it's full of funny and witty things. And mm -hmm. and if you if you understand a little bit about how telegraphy developed, you can you can anticipate the directions in which it's going. So, for example, uh, this is this is a this is a means of optical telegraphy that has limited applicability. But once again, if you can, um, let's see, I'm trying to, uh, the digitization, uh, let me, uh, I'm sorry about this. I have to like get out and from, from the banner here. I've got a question for you, Charles, when yes. you set up. I'll wait till sure. you get the tech okay. piece out. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm back on sharing. Do we do you or do we have any idea of were there many eaves out there in the world in those days? Uh, you know, men or women in the middle? Uh, 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 yes, I think all of were, and and we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. This is um, th this this is an example of how you transmit the information. Now, of course, you know this another a, a separate part of of this book has to do with instead of this is this is called you know free space optical communication which is sending a message text through the air and you know, as we'll discuss momentarily there are means for encoding this message in a in an unintelligible alphabet that would not be understandable by an uh, eavesdropper. Okay, so um, this this system was implemented. Uh, oh, so the 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 use of semaphore signals is a similar idea. You have a sort of fixed positions, and then you put the the flags in these several fixed positions to make an alphabet. And this, you know, by the way, it's a, you know it indicates. Well, the there are 25 characters needed for the um, uh, English alphabet. That's two to the fifth is 32. So that's like having a, a five-bit binary uh, representation can encode all the uh, elements of the English alphabet and some numbers. And um, these sorts of systems were implemented in a number of places, most notably in France, in the Napoleonic era. And if you see on the left hand here, there's an illustration of a tower with some semaphore veins that can be set in various orientations. And this uh, man in the telescope is looking at another tower in the distance, which is also affixed with a telescope and a semaphore signal. So Napoleon, who was at war with most of the rest of Europe, had a need for uh, long distance, fast and reliable communication. And uh, the central image shows a, <clears throat> a map of the French national optical telegraph uh, network. And it is said that a symbol um, a character could be transmitted from Paris to Lyon 
in about nine minutes, which is very fast compared to the speed of any type of communication, uh, surface communication possible in France in those days. And that, um, that type of system was widely used. And again, once again, many place names come from it. I think you've probably all heard the name of Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. That comes from its original use as the site of an optical telegraph, which could see signals from ships entering the from the Golden Gate into the harbor of San Francisco, and then trans, transmit information to merchants in the town. Now, once again, all these things, and there are many other Telegraph Hill place names in the world, Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. Uh, again, this was this system was eventually completely displaced by the electrical telegraph, which wasn't, you know, wasn't subject to fog or rain or, you know, at least not in the same way, uh, loss of, of optical uh, uh, line of sight communications and could travel much longer. So by the, you know, by the end of the 19th century, uh, optical telegraphy had pretty been much given up for dead. Uh, we'll get back to electric telegraph telegraphy in a moment because it plays a very another very important role, in fact, in the foundational ideas of quantum cryptography. Uh, but before doing so, I'd just like to invite anyone in the audience to suggest. Uh, an application where optical telegraphy might still be used. That is, the use of, of an optical signal to transmit information between two distant points. Anyone? I'm not going to say anything more until I get at least one answer. Uh, Navy ships code between ships to a signal still, I think. Ah, signals, be signals between naval ships. Yes, that's right. Well, they still use uh, they still use these blinker when they're when they're operating radio science. They still use blinker lights and and also um, a system of naval flags, uh, which can send quite a bit of complex information. So that's a good example. Who wants to who wants to suggest something else? Well, no, it's digital, but what about fiber optic communication? Well, you've 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 gotten right to the point. In fact, here is the greatest telegraphy system yet devised. It's called the internet. People say it might be big someday. For undersea fibers alone, there are 1.3 million kilometers of fiber optics cable laid under the ocean, and this is the vehicle for all internet traffic between continents. And within countries, most of the um, internet traffic on the backbone is also handled by optical fibers. It's so superior to electricity. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't do this at this scale with electricity because of the losses. But then it utilizes technologies that were completely unknown in in the days of electronics fiber optics okay that that received the nobel prize in physics in 2009 which is not that long ago and it relied on lasers another nobel prize winning invention to effectively couple light into fibers and then a whole vast array of um, uh, electronic interfaces so indeed, you might say optical telegraphy continues to rule the world. And it's, it's done that by being, by being driven forward with new advances of technology that were never anticipated by anyone who worked in the, in the earlier, uh, uh, earlier you know, actual manifestations of the technology. But they had a vision for, for what would be important. So yeah, optics, I'm a big proponent of optics. Okay, let's now, um, 
let's now go to the issue of data encryption and decryption. So, uh, so this goes back to um, the issue that Terrell raised about an eavesdropper watching the signals of the torches. Because, okay, so um, uh, here, here's a table given by Polybius uh, that could be used with the Tiki torches to send alphabetical information. But you could write the table in a different way. You could use, for example, write the, the alphabet along rows, A, B, C, D, E, along rows, and then continue along columns. Or you could have a completely arbitrary <coughs> arrangement of the letters in those places, and th those would give rise to different signals. So a very, a very simple idea of how to conceal how to conceal information in uh, a modified alphabet is given by this decoder ring. Captain Midnight Secret Squadron decoder ring is a popular uh, giveaway associated with a, a radio show in the 1940s. Yeah, let me um, let me emphasize that this. Um, what we're really interested in now is not just sending a secret message, which you could always do by memorizing the message yourself and then traveling yourself to the person that you wanted to convey it to, and then you know walking with them out in a place where they're unobserved and whispering it to them. Uh, that's probably the only way, the only secure way of conveying a secret message. Then you have to wonder if you're talking to the right person. But more important, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're, what you, what you want to do is to transmit information to a counterparty using the most efficient means. Like, for example, you want to send streaming video of the grandkids, their grandmother. Well, you do that not by carrying one developed photograph picture to grandma at a time. You want to use the cheap public communication system because that's the way to um, have the lowest cost, the most reliable transmission. The incremental cost of transmission of that type now is basically zero. And so, uh, you want to send a communication that anyone who receives it will not know how to read it unless they have particular instructions on how to do so. And so that's what's accomplished by the so-called key. You have a plain text message. This I just made this one up. Alice, here's, this introduces a common terminology, a transmitter of information, Alice, and a receiver, conventionally known as Bob. And we'll see there's, there's an interposed between them, there'll be an adversary, Eve, who's an eavesdropper. So Alice has a simple message, strike Monday, that she wants to send to Bob. And they're going to use the um, Captain uh, Midnight Secret Squadron decoder ring. So this is, a, this is an arrangement of two circles of letters. One is fixed on the metal uh, surface on the outer part of the ring, and the other is a number ring that rotates freely. <coughs> it just has the letters uh, 1 through uh, 26. And the way that you, the key, is determined by a setting that can be communicated in this case as P9. So P the, uh, is the, the letter on the brass surface and then the number ring has been rotated so that 9 lies below P. So that E then has the code of 8, S has a code of 7, Q has a code of 6, and so on. So um, uh, what Alice does is she takes her 
message text strike it's for the s she reads off the seven for the t where is that that's a four and so on and gets this so-called cipher text of numbers and she sends that to bob on the open channel so on the open channel an eavesdropper can intercept this this uh, this string of numbers. Now, if you look at that string, uh, if you receive that string of numbers, if I'd sent this to you on a different day, what could you infer from that string alone? Well, let's say, or I'll say, let's say, what information would you need start, you know, starting in order of increasing uh, complexity? What information would you need to uh, figure out from that text alone, the cipher text alone, what it meant? Anyone? You need the key. Yes. Well, let's suppose if you have the key, obviously, yeah, maybe I should have proceeded from that. If you have the cipher text, then this is the nice thing about this system is that the, the key provides both the encrypting and decrypting mechanism. In other words, to, to if you have the cipher text uh, 7 and you know that the key is P9, then you just have to you have to align the your, your both Alice and Bob have their own copy of this decoder badge, uh, and so if you know if you if they and they have they have a previously shared secret which is called the key. In other words, they've agreed ahead of time that the key will be this P nine. So let's say that you knew that Alice and Bob were communicating in English language and that they were sending symbols that were letters. From this sequence of letters alone, could you infer what their message was? I, I would point out the context of the message would be important. So if the message was the word yes, it's meaningless. Yeah, I, the, con the context is important, and my question is whether just from the, this is the important concept in theoretical cryptography. If the cipher, without understanding the context, which is actually, the context is very, very important in practical cryptography, but if we're talking about a, you know, a machine-guided process, Without understanding the context, what can you learn from the cipher text alone? Well, and, fortunately, this one doesn't have any frequency <coughs> to use. They're all different letters, so they got lucky there. Yes. So um, that illustrates, you know, an informed viewpoint. There's no, there's no repetition of any any character here. Now, you might say if you'd you'd suspect that they were. These are representations of English letters, okay? If you knew that Alice and Bob were uh, English speakers. What if you knew that they also each had a Captain Midnight Secret Squadron decoder ring, but you didn't know what the key was? Could you then infer the message? I mean, you could brute force it, I suppose. How, how many attempts would it take to brute force it? Um, more than I have time for. <laughs> well, you know, there's 26, there's 26 letters and there's 26 numbers. And those two things are the letters in a rigid order, as are the numbers. So there's basically, there's, only, there's 26 possible settings of the, of the ring. 
So for a short message, the brute force, you know, is going to give you 26 10 digits letters, 10 digit letter, 10 digit messages to read. Now it might turn out that there are several <coughs> meaningful um, strings embedded in that, but quite possibly then the context will give you some guidance. So understanding the um, understanding the nature of the keying system actually is quite important. And then as uh, the previous commenter said, this this is a very short uh, message. If you were if you were sending a, a longer message or a sequence of messages all using the same key, and they were just and they were uh, enciphered ordinary ordinary English message text, then you could look at the frequency. In other words, if there's a unique substitution of one letter for another, then you can you can do a frequency analysis. Yeah. ETA, OIN are the most frequently um, uh, used letters in English. So you can, you can make a guess at those characters from their frequency in the intercepted cipher text. And then there are, there's a frequency of, of most frequent pairs or triples. And from those, you can, uh, you can infer additional information. Now, there's a, there are ways around that, and um, they mostly have to do, well, this is the so-called Caesarean alphabet, Caesarean code, where you have a, a, a fixed substitution of, a let, of one letter by another. Effectively, it's a letter by number uh, and with, a con, with a symmetric conversion back again. So that, that amounts to a... Um, replacing one alphabet by another with a certain registration between the two alphabets, like P9. So if you also vary the key, so you can only use a fixed key for that for so long before the messages will become, all become decoded. If you keep changing the key, then you can make the whole code harder and harder to break. And a, um, probably the best known example of this is shown by this uh, Enigma, it's a brand name machine, introduced in the 1920s for automatic encryption. You pressed a, you pressed a, a, a key on this keyboard and then it would light a number up, it light a character up on this, on this upper viewing pane. And that would be the encoding. And it had a number of these rotors which would be switched around so that basically a new alphabet, a new substitution alphabet was used for every character. And the mechanics of the machine and some initial uh, key settings that were a shared secret between the two parties in a communication would enable one to send quite a bit of code uh, with, without giving much of this um, revealing information like replication of letters. It was hard to break. It was a pretty good machine. Uh, and it was adopted by the German military in the late 1920s uh, for use as a military encryption system. Now, here's, here's an example of the Enigma machine. Uh, it's use on the battlefield in France. And again, once again, uh, in a battlefield environment, encryption of information, or let's say concealment of information is very important uh, because you don't want the enemy, the adversary to know what you're up to. And also, it's rapidity of communication is also very important. If you're, especially in an operation like, uh, what do the Germans call it, the Blitzkrieg, you know, operating mobilized armies across large uh, areas of battle. Or, you know, I don't know, 
trading, you know, trading stocks on several exchanges, very similar problems. Um, however, this was broken, uh, the commercial version was broken by the Polish Cipher Bureau, which was the name of the uh, agency of the Polish government, which was responsible for uh, encryption and decryption. And uh, they communicated their, uh, on the outbreak of war, they communicated what they knew to uh, France and Britain. And this resulted in a um, uh, massive, you know, first, basically, the, you might say the first industrial scale computation facility was ever built. And Alan Turing, the great genius of information theory was uh, was a leading actor in its implementation and it was um, <coughs> it was very successful in um, encrypting German military communications particularly particularly those made by German submarines the submarines served uh, two military purposes one of course is for attacking ships and the other is just in general they can they can venture long distances without being detected so they could they could provide information about weather in the Atlantic Ocean that the Germans could use to predict weather which is important in designing military operations uh, but again uh, you know as uh, I guess it was Terrell alluded to uh, these the great successes of um, of the breaking of the enigma, and this is a famous story. You can read about there are books written about it. And there are a lot of thrilling incidents in it. Uh, they were not based on crypt analysis alone, but they also required, uh, on some occasions, the well, uh, really military action that is for example there was a key change <coughs> i think in 1944 that put the the computer out of business for months because there was a i think a new rotor that was introduced and there was no you know there's a new basis that made the, the problem uh to be too complex to be attacked by the computational tools at hand and that was only solved by a British ship um, staging a raid on a German submarine on the high seas and seizing the encryption apparatus in the code books. And that in an action that in which two British sailors knowingly gave up their lives in order to get that encryption device out of the sub. So it's, you know, it's not in a, even when you have a sort of pseudo randomness, you can make a um, a pretty good uh, a pretty good encryption machine that requires a lot of um, a, a lot of activity on the part of an adversary to compromise. Now, to come to the present day. This RSA encryption, I, in my personal opinion, it's one of the, it's one of the greatest inventions of all time, and uh, whatever my opinion is, it it underpins all of modern electronic commerce. I mean, every time you make a purchase from an internet vendor or do do anything requires encryption on the internet, you're using the public key infrastructure. A, a brilliant intellectual idea, which is introduced, I think, by Diffie and Hellman in the first instance, but just to keep it simple with current applications, uh, the implementations uh, devised by Rudess Schumer and Edelman, in which you have an encryption key that's public and a decryption key that's private. So when you make a purchase from a well-known internet retailer, there's this, 
you know, an engagement of these two public and private keys to create a sort of shared secret, secret that's then used to encrypt the mutual transmissions between them. And um, the difficulty of breaking this encryption reduces the problems, uh, reduces to the problem of finding the prime factors of the large number. So this, ha this has an important implication. Now finding prime numbers, let's say, you know, there's a theorem, fundamental theorem of arithmetic that says every number can re be represented as a, a, a product of a unique number of primes. And I guess you, you prove that just by saying, okay, <clears throat> you start you start dividing it by prime numbers and then you remultiply them back together until you get the number back itself. And if you don't, um, if, if that, if that, well, let's see, if we do that for 100, we see that 100 is uh, 4 times 25, 2 times 2 times 5 times 5. 101 is a prime number. It doesn't have any simpler factors. Of course, uh, every other number is not prime, right? So 102 is now, you know, this 2 times 3 times 17. 103 is prime. 104, uh, you see another, you see another sample factorization. So, what are the implications of this? Uh, how many how many calculations do you need to do to find the prime factors of a given number? given integer number. Well, I've shown some examples, and what, I mean, you know, I, I thought about this question long ago when I was like, you know, an undergraduate student, and uh, I wanted to know, you know, identify, I think maybe it was given to me as a problem, identify a procedure for finding a prime number. Well, okay, uh, it's always a good idea to use brute force and see what that gives. And in the case of prime numbers, the brute force, uh, the brute force calculation has an interesting aspect, which I think you can, maybe I can convince you of in simple language. You see that the, the largest of the prime numbers in this sequence, the largest of the number of prime factors in this sequence, it's either the number itself or something that's not much greater than the square root of that number. So in fact, if you think a little bit further about it, if you want to find all the prime factors of a number, you only have, by brute force, you, you only have to check a, um, up to the square root of that number. Which, you know, for those of you who are work in quantum chemistry, this is like almost too good to be true. In quantum chemistry, typically the number of calculations you have to do goes to like, I don't know, the fourth power of the number of electrons or something like that. And here it just grows to the square root. It seems rather slow. Doesn't sound bad. And the best proven result for this number it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but the message is the same. Uh, it does grow rather slowly compared to the number. On the other hand, the cost grows, uh, the number grows as 2 to the power of the binary digits in the number. So I've been using decimal digits for these numbers here but they could be done in a binary representation. And like in a binary representation, every bit that you add doubles the size of the number space. So you might say, <clears throat> if, you, if you had the most powerful computer in the world and applied that 
to breaking an uh, RSA key of B bits, where B is some number like, I don't know, 200. And the most powerful computer in the world is just barely able to break that in a reasonable time. Then all the encryptor has to do to defeat the decryptor is to add a few more bits to the representation of the numbers. Because every bit that you add doubles the size of the number space. So in other words, by, you know, if you have, I don't know, 200 bit RSA and your adversary has, has been able by heroic effort to break that, if you just add another 30 bits to it, you make the problem a thousand times harder. And your cost of adding 30 bits is basically zero. So that, um, that is what people thought would make the public key infrastructure stable for a very long time to come. I mean, as, as computers grew in power and in number, you'd have to add some more bits. But, you know, basically, your ability to um, add bits would increase in roughly the same way as the power computers. And the encryptor would always have an advantage over the encrypted analyst. Uh, th this was the prevailing view. Have, have, I, have I explained this in an understandable way that why, why it's this method of digital encryption is so powerful? It takes, um, because it, it, the computational effort needed to identify the key grows exponentially, uh, grows with some power of the um, number of bits, whereas the size of the space that's involved grows exponentially with the number of bits. Any comments on that? following you at least okay so uh, that was let's see now I think I do have to go into the uh, shared screen mode that was that was the um, view up until 1994 when this genius Peter Shore then at AT&T Bell Laboratories proves that a quantum computer could crack a um, uh, the RSA key with, well, the way it's, there's a balance between the number of computational steps and the resource, the size of the, of the resource space you need. But if you say if it goes that the, the number scales is the cube of the um, number of bits of the number, that's you know, that's, a, that's a pretty good metric. So that meant that a quantum computer, a, a quantum computer, general purpose quantum computer, could, could break, could come to advantage. The crypt, the crypt analyst could come to advantage with the encryptor following evolutionary. And in fact, I would say that is the reason and the only reason why you're listening to, to the, this talk today. I mean, that is the that is the defining moment that sort of like the, the Pearl Harbor or the Sputnik moment of quantum computing, in which at least it became theoretically possible to do something that was inconceivable previously and that it clearly, even in those days, it was understood how great an impact that that could have on society. Well, the original focus was probably on matters like national security. So let me, uh, so now I want to, uh, 
go go back uh, go talk about the you know the framework in which uh, digital technology evolved that led to the algorithm we, the, the fundamental algorithm we used in quantum cryptography purpose quantum so once again, in let's see, I'm, I'm not sharing the screen now, am I? Correct. Sorry. Here. So in uh, the link between mathematical logic and cryptography became became clarified by studying of the mechanics of elect of electrical circuits so here's um here is a um uh, boolean logic and which can be implemented with electromagnetic this this uh this observation is due largely to gilbert vernon who is uh was a uh electrical engineer in Bell Telephone Laboratories. Logic operation A and B has a truth table that I, that I illustrate here. And that can be realized by a simple electromechanical circuit. So you don't have to know too much about electricity. If here's a battery, and if it provides current that goes through a light emitting diode, then the light, the LED will, will light. And so we'll call the lit LED has a value of one, and uh, and a dark LED is value zero. So for A of zero and B of zero, both these switches open. Uh, you get no current. If one switch is open, the other is closed. No current. The same thing symmetrically. Only if both switches are set to one, do you get a one. That's the AND operation. Here's the OR. So that you don't again you don't need to know much about electrical circuitry except to say that the the LED is going to get lit only if there's a, a closed current path that leads to it. So here's the first one is what we call um, switches in parallel in which they both have to be closed in order to get a one. Here are switches in, in, uh, like, no, sorry. These are these are switches in series. Both have to be closed uh, to get uh, the uh, current through. And here they're in parallel. If 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 either one of A, if if B is closed uh, and A is open, you get current through. If both A and B are open, you don't. If A is closed and B is open, you get current through the upper path. And if they're if they're, if they're both closed, then you also get uh, current. And then the third one, which is the most important for um, this discussion, the exclusive OR gate, sometimes called XOR. Uh, you see a show of hands. How many people have heard of this? And or an exclusive or. Actually, I don't know who's home. Okay, at least someone. Yeah, many people. Yeah, but they're they're coming in. Okay, so that's great. We're not going to go through all this, but I mean, I, it's actually I, I encourage you to think for yourself about how to construct some of these circuits on and with simple electromechanical model because it's you know it's really by realizing these fundamental concepts in machines and in efficient ways that we actually you know make advances in technology okay now uh, why is exclusive or so important well, because Vernum, here's a patent. So this is, I'll, I'll tell you first, the Vernum cipher that I'm about to describe is the workhorse of quantum cryptography. Basically, quantum cryptography, which should be really called quantum key distribution, 
<clears throat> involves using quantum mechanics to produce uh, a shared secret key for Alice and Bob. So Vernum um, uh, said, well, and, and he, he gave some diagrams to suggest it. You can, um, you can make a symmetric key system by, here's your message text, M, and then you make a, um, a cipher, which is another random binary sequence. Uh, it's, it's a binary random sequence. And how do you use the key? You use the key by doing the exclusive OR of the message with the cipher text. So here I'm doing 1, 0, XOR, that is 1, 0, 0, XOR, 0, 1, 1, XOR, 0, 0, 1, XOR, 1, and so on. And now, and this is, uh, this is something that I encourage you to construct a mathematical proof of. It's like a lot of proofs, proofs involving binary digits. It's quite easy to produce this by brute force because there are only like four possibilities. If you send the cipher text over the public channel to Bob, then Bob can use the same, exactly the same key the exclusive OR of the cipher text gives the message back. I once saw a beautiful demonstration of this. I wish I had the, some images of it. The, the uh, uh, encryption of, a, of an image, a black and a grayscale image uh, of, you know, a duck or something. Encryption by an exclusive OR with a random bit stream. So that that gives just a, a screen of white noise. There's no trace of any image left in it. And then, then a, you're also shown the image of the, uh, the key itself, the, the digital key itself. Another, another <coughs> white static screen. Then you do the exclusive OR of those two random patterns. And like magic, the image appears. You have to see it for yourself. So this is a very, it's a beautiful idea. How to generate, you just need to generate this simple binary key. And Vernum suggested, and the suggestion seems plausible, that this would, if you had such a key that was completely random, then uh, no information could be inferred from reading of the cipher text by the eavesdropper Eve. Now this was um, this was uh, <coughs> proven later by Cla the great Claude Shannon, also of Bell Laboratories, about 20 years later. He proved the condition. He proved the security of the Vernum cipher, the conditions under which the Vernum cipher is secure. First, the digits of K have to, have to truly be random. And believe me, it's not easy to make things truly random. Then the second one, and this is, this is also a considerable constraint, that the key must have at least as many digits as the plain text. So in other words, this doubles the size, this means that the the key has to be as long as the message, which is certainly not the case for things like RSA. And then no part of the key may ever be reused. And the key must remain secret to Alice and Bob. Okay, so what could possibly go wrong? Well, one... Uh, one way of, uh, of implementing the Vernum cipher, which is widely used in, in espionage. Here's an example of a so-called one, well, two examples of a one-time pad. Um, you have a, 
you know, we have a government agency sending a spy to a foreign country, the spy will be sent with a, a, a set of set of random digits, which are to be used once and only once to encode and decode messages. So two copies of the one-time pad have to be printed, one for the sender, one for the recipient. And this, I'll make these slides available later if you want to go through the exercise yourself. You just take, uh, you take a plain text message and you use the first letter block to encrypt it, to make the cipher text for the first digit, the second block to make the second digit, the third block and the third, and so on. That gives a cipher text. And then the recipient of the message with their um, one-time pad <clears throat> can, use, can use this. It's a symmetric key system, very elegant to get the plain text message back again. So it's not like the exclusive or, but it's of comparable uh, simplicity. And, uh, okay, what, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the first thing is uh, you need to have, you know, if you have like these two remote parties that are going to be exchanging messages, then they have to have and, and they're going to be doing it for years, then they have to have a lot of one-time pads. That means you need to produce them, and they can't ever be reused. So a uh, major, uh, really fascinating story concerning a failure of, of this system. It wasn't a failure of the one-time pad itself, but it was a failure of you know, the problem of putting it in, into mass production, the so-called Venona Project in which uh, the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C., you know, from the, about 1942 through 1950, was using uh, one-time pads to send radio transmissions from Washington, D.C. to Moscow. And there were, um, you know, there was a mistake made in production. And so uh, this made it possible for cryptanalysts uh, of the National Security Agency to decode major parts of conversations, but but not all of them. And there's a you know great story to be found uh, on the internet about that. So now this is the last slide. What is quantum cryptography? In all the manifestations with which I'm familiar including this Chinese uh, satellite experiment that uh, was done, was shown on the first slide. The quantum aspect of the process is in the generation of a one-time pad key that is shared by remote participants, Alice and Bob. And, um, and it's not known to anyone else. So in other words, the quantum mechanics comes into the process of generating the shared secret, and then that shared secret is used in uh, a process that would have been trivially familiar to Gilbert Vernon in 1919. The actual the actual code is transmitted classically uh, using the quantum generated key. So that's the um, the key message. Uh, often, you know, I like I was at a military briefing about two years ago, uh, in which uh, someone was questioning whether quantum uh, quantum encryption could work even if there was, you know, in a very hostile environment with no possible um, conventional communication with the outside. Like, say, in the middle of a nuclear war in which, you know, the, the radio waves are full of noise. And the answer is, uh, no, it can't. It, it depends upon the, the basic conditions of communication, but it does have this remarkable element that Alice and Bob <coughs> can, by 
a set of, of quantum measurements generate a secret shared key indefinitely. And the following two lectures are going to be um, the first and the next one will be about the basic uh, physical processes of light that can be used to generate that key. And the third lecture will be about um, the actual generation of that key in the context of the uh, Bennett Prasad 1984 protocol. So I think I've ended on time and uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions. Anybody? So, am I jumping ahead by thinking that uh, the generation of the key uh, with light would be using um, entanglement with photons? So in the BB-84, it does not use entanglement. The first protocol, and uh, the, the, this most recent Chinese experiment does use entanglement, but there was an earlier experiment of the same type satellite communication with the ground station that used unentangled photon pairs. So uh, entanglement, entanglement is not necessary. Uh, this, what's, what's essential is that Alice and Bob, uh, the communication between them involves single photons. And the, the entanglement becomes, it's certainly the use of an entangled photon. So, so uh, I'll go into this in more detail in the third lecture. But basically, the, the, the transaction in BB84 is Alice sends a photon uh, to Bob, who performs a measurement on it. And Alice is, you know, it's required that Alice makes random choices of photons to send to Bob. And Bob makes random choices of measurements to apply to them. And these two randomness activities plus uh, the measurement, projected measurement process of quantum mechanics assures that you get a random, uh, random and a secure key. In other words, well, we'll get, we'll get to the security aspect uh, in the next two lectures. <laughs> what entanglement does, in entanglement, typically you have a single, let's call it a single atom, effectively a single atom, that produces two photons. And those two photons are, um, they're the result of a quantum process, the emission of two photons by an atom, or the absorption of one photon and the emission of two photons. And those photons are intrinsically random, and that ra that randomness can be checked by the use of um, so-called Bell inequalities. So there's a there's a conceptual advantage in the uh, unentangled in the entangled photon sources of having a source that can't even be uh, it can be under the control of the eavesdropper, and it still can't be manipulated in order to break the key, which is, you know, I mean, that's that's pretty awesome. But I'd say understanding the basic protocol, uh, how it works, is a pretty good first step to understanding how entanglement then becomes an addition. Uh, on the other hand, in, you know, in a practical sense, uh, the Chinese are implementing a uh, quantum key distribution system over distances of, you know, 100 kilometers on land. And um, all the, the uh, <coughs> bit rates that are possible in the uh, BB-84 BB sources are much higher than they, than they are in the tank sources. So I said, you know, in both cases, we're dealing with, with technology that's 
early stages. Anything else? We're going to need more questions on on day two and three. Okay, well, I'll put in a few more Easter eggs. There you go. Okay, thanks All everybody right. for listening. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it. Everybody, uh, an hour before the session tomorrow, you'll get the Zoom link. Hopefully, the YouTube uh, feed will work as well. So we'll see you all then. Same time, different Zoom link. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.